Hello, and welcome to the Great Philosophers of Fanshawe College. This is Nick McGinnis. Let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon, actually a uh, kind of a contemporary of Descartes, born a little bit earlier. Francis Bacon uh, is kind of the father of British empiricism. He's a good contrast with Descartes, whereas Descartes uh, tended to be a rationalist who tried to reason from first premises. Bacon was very much an empiricist who wished to defend observation as a source of knowledge. Um, I put a little quote in, a very funny quote from a Redditor, a Redditor about, uh, about a quote from Francis Bacon. He says, when I was young, my father said to me, knowledge is power, Francis Bacon. And I understood it as knowledge is power and France is Bacon. For more than a decade, I wondered of the meaning of the second part. What was the surreal linkage between the two? If I said the quote to someone, knowledge is power, France is Bacon, they nodded knowingly. Or someone might say, knowledge is power, and I'd finish the quote saying, France is Bacon. And they'd look at me like I said something odd, but they would thoughtfully agree. I asked a teacher, what did knowledge is power, France is Bacon mean? I got this 10 minute explanation of the knowledge is power bit, but nothing on France is Bacon. When I prompted further explanation by saying, Francis Bacon? In a questioning tone, I just got a, yes. At 12, I didn't have the confidence to press it further. I just accepted it as something I never understand. <sighs> it wasn't until years later I saw it written down that the penny dropped. Anyway, I found that hilarious. Something very similar happened to me. Um, I remember reading and coming across the adjective, probably in a newspaper, Machiavellian. Now, we all know now that something is Machiavellian, if it's a kind of a ruthless form of political machination, um, typically that is uh, kind of somebody's evil, complicated scheme coming to fruition, his Machiavellian plans. Um, and I didn't really understand where that word came from, so I asked my dad, Dad, what does Machiavellian mean? And, and he launches, and this is true, he launches into the story that he just made up on the spot, I think, to troll me uh, about, about a very dastardly kind of cowboy, you know, wearing a black hat, um, that terrorized the Old West called Machiavel, Machiavel, some kind of like Hebrew gunslinger of the Old West, and uh, the legend of his deeds in the Wild West went down to infamy, and to the extent that now we call things Machiavellian. Um, now I was like a kid, and I, I just took this at face value, um, and for me the pen moment when the penny dropped came when somewhere in grade school uh, a teacher I think it was like sixth grade, maybe seventh grade teacher in history class. And, you know, does anybody know where Machiavellian comes from? And I'm like, oh gosh, I asked my dad about this, and I remember this great story. So I, my hand shoots up, and I, you know, the whole class looks at me. Uh, I was, you know, socially awkward kid. Don't usually talk in class very much, and I, I start launching into the tale of Machiavel, legendary outlaw of the old west. Um. <clears throat> it went about as well as you'd imagine. Uh, anyway, enough about my childhood. Let's talk about Francis Bacon. Seriously, though, Francis Bacon, uh, a scientist who wasn't very good at it. Uh, he, you know, he, for all his talk about the scientific method and empiricism, he didn't really contribute that much to science himself. Uh, but he did, as a philosopher, contribute significantly to the development of the early scientific method. Right, he was an empiricist, which is as kind of the, the British tended to be empiricists, uh, unlike Descartes, who was more of a rationalist, as philosophers on the European continent tended to be. To this day, uh, there's a cleavage, a distinction uh, between Anglo-American philosophers uh, who tend to be uh, more empirical, you know, who view philosophy and the sciences as tightly intertwined and what we call continental philosophers uh, who actually see philosophy as uh, pretty much independent of science. Uh, Bacon had a pretty active life. He was a statesman, a jurist, an orator, an essayist, an author. He was Attorney General and Lord Chancellor of England. He was accused of corruption and of taking bribes, which apparently everyone did at that time, but his political enemies uh, kind of conspired to make sure that he'd be charged for it. Um, Russell says, quote, he has permanent importance as the founder of modern inductive method and the, the pioneer in the attempt at logical systematization of scientific procedure. So Bacon, says Russell, was the first of the long line of scientifically minded philosophers who have emphasized the importance of induction as opposed to deduction. Uh, this is actually a really important distinction. 
deduction is logical and certain, right? We've done a little bit of deductive logic in the context of Aristotle's logic. Right? The thing about deduction as a method is that the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion, right? So if the premises are true, the conclusion is necessarily true, right? For example, if I say, look, either A or B is true. It's either one or the other. It's either A or B. Ah, but it's not the case that A is true. Therefore, B is true, right? This conclusion is deductive, right? If it's either one thing or the other, and I can eliminate one possibility, it has to be the other, given that it is one or the other and that one of them is false. So if I say, look, either the butler or the maid did the murder, uh, but here we have evidence uh, exonerating the butler, then therefore the maid uh, committed the crime. Right, that'd be that's perfectly sound logic. Maybe the premises aren't true, right? Maybe it was not the butler or the maid, but the chauffeur did the crime. But then my premises aren't true, right? Uh, deductive logic is certain so long as the in, in in the sense that it gives you this kind of conditional guarantee that if the premises are true, the conclusion is true. Now induction is different from deduction. It's often regarded as somewhat inferior because it does not confer certainty in the same way. Knowledge gained by observation, by empirical observation, and therefore by induction, can always be challenged because the truth of the premises does not guarantee the truth of the conclusion in the same way. Now, so what is, what is induction? How does it work, then, if it's not logic? Well, the simplest form of inductive generalization, uh, which Bacon... Uh, kind of challenges is the, what he calls enumeration. He says, look, we move from a set of observations to some general conclusion. Look, we've observed 50 white swans, therefore all swans are white. Um, so this simplistic method is fraught with peril, right? And uh, it, all you need to do is observe a black swan and then your whole inductive generalization is out the window. And indeed, uh, it seems impossible to move from any finite set of observations to a universal conclusion, right? It, uh, you can see 50 specimens of something and then move from that to, therefore, all of them are like that. It seems just like a bad procedure, right? We wouldn't do that uh, for mathematics, right? We wouldn't say, well, uh, you know, if I'm trying to count uh, the, the, the prime numbers and I list you 50 prime numbers and I say, well, I guess all the prime numbers are odd. All the prime numbers are odd numbers. Um, that's not a proof. That's just like a very long list of things. Now, of course, there's an even prime number, too. Um, so how to use inductive reasoning in this epistemically respectable way was a major early scientific problem. Uh, and this is actually why induction is good because it's what we call ampliative. It amplifies knowledge, right? It tells us something new, not already contained in the premises. In a way, that's what makes it actually induction better than deduction, because every deductive inference has the conclusion already implicit in its premises. Deduction, the deduction only makes it explicit. If you look at the premises of any deductive argument, you'll see that the information is already in the premises. And all the, dedu all the deduction does is, is takes that information and makes it really explicit. If I say either A or B, not A, the fact that not B is true is already there in the premises. Right? It is the amplitude character of induction that makes it less certain, yes, but the trade-off for that loss of certainty is the fact that you, at the end of an induction, you have more information than you started with. You're not as certain of the information, but bonus, you have more of it. Whereas a deduction, you're absolutely certain, but you don't really learn anything new that wasn't already in the premises. Right? Maybe you didn't realize that information was in the premises, but trust me, it's there. We could talk about that on Tuesday, if you're not sure what I mean. Um, so as Bacon says, look, good inductive reasoning is much more subtle than generalization from observation. As Bacon said, quote, the induction which proceeds by simple enumeration is just childish. And in the modern scientific method, this is why we test hypotheses in really strictly controlled environments, right? We might use a control group. We might deploy sophisticated statistical analysis to find out what is the actual strength of an effect, right? So if I want to test a medicine, I don't just give people the medicine and observe the results. I might also uh, tell another group that they're receiving medicine, but give them a placebo. 
uh, I, the researcher should also not know who's getting the placebo and who's getting the real medicine. So their own bias doesn't play into their interpretation of the results and so on and so forth. So it's a this is very complicated process to try and um, isolate the important variables in a controlled environment to test a hypothesis in a way that you don't bias the result because of what you hope is true. All right? I linked to a paper here and uh, it's worth reading. It's a bit long but it's this great little paper on testing uh, an apparently simple hypothesis, um, which is that hot water freezes faster than cold water. It sounds crazy, right? That why would hot water freeze faster than cold water? But apparently, under certain conditions, this is true. Apparently. And I say apparently because it turns out testing something that sounds simple in natural language, hot water freezes faster than cold water, requires a ton of assumptions and variables that each need to be carefully controlled. And uh, Bacon was really the first to caref carefully think through what good inductive reasoning required, right, in terms of a controlled hypothesis testing and variable isolation, and also defended its epistemic work worth. Now, there had been lots of good science around that period, um, but pretty much everybody was making up a scientific method as they went along, trying to draw their own general conclusions, but Bacon was the one that really sat down and tried to start figuring it out. So the hot water freezing faster than cold case study is one I really like. It's called the Mpemba effect. Um, it was the, it was, I think it was a Tanzanian uh, grade school child that had noticed it and brought it up to his teacher. The class made fun of him, but he did the experiment with his teacher, and apparently it's kind of true under certain circumstances, but nobody really understands why hot water would freeze faster than cold, and it's led to uh, years and years of people trying to figure this out. And as Wikipedia points out, investigations of the Mpemba effect need to control a large number of initial parameters, right? The type and the initial temperature of the water, uh, the amount of dissolved gas and other impurities, the size, the shape, the material of the container, the temperature of the refrigerator, and on and on. And you need to settle on a particular method of establishing, quote, the time of freezing, whatever that means, right? What, when would you say that an ice cube is frozen, when it starts freezing, when it's completely frozen, um, when there's like a film of ice on top but it's still liquid underneath. You need to define all these things and how you define any one of these variables will change the nature of your result, right? Uh, all of which, continue, to continue the quote, might affect the presence or absence of the Mpemba effect, right? This required vast multi-dimensional array of experiments might explain why the effect is not yet fully understood. So have we observed it? Well, maybe. Turns out science is not just observation and generalization from observation. It is the uh, careful engineering of circumstance right, in order to kind of isolate and test variables to determine what affects what. And from there, uh, the testing and falsification of hypotheses. So. And Bacon was really the first one to start thinking about this, right? A central part of uh, Bacon's method was this notion that you should isolate significant variables and factors. Um, so what he did, he talked about, say, for example, heat, and he would enumerate the instances of the phenomena to be investigated like heat, and says, what are the common properties that emerge in all instances uh, of this? Um, and Because these will kind of be the focus investigation, right? And so by isolating the common properties of a phenomena and discarding others, uh, we're able to start making uh, predictions. And it's this ability to make predictions that could either be confirmed or falsified that'll help us uh, be confident in our ampliative inferences, i.e. in our induction, in our new knowledge we didn't have before. So if some factor is common to many instances of phenomena, we could predict that it'll be present in new instances, right? So if we discover that uh, I c an electrical field is present in all cases of magnetism, I should be able to say something like, well, whenever there's a magnet, there's an electrical field. And if I discover a new kind of magnet and there's no electrical field, then I've falsified this hypothesis. Um, but as we now know, of course, uh, magnetism and electricity are one and the same. So that would be a good instance of finding common, pro isolating common variables and testing them to generate predictions. So uh, here's Bacon in his own words, defending empiricism. Um, and defending empiricism has, uh, now we don't really need to because we have 
technology around us, science has kind of taken it for granted. But for a long time, you can imagine why empiricism and induction would be contrasted unfavorably with rationalism and de deduction. Because the thing about math and geometry uh, and logic and reasoning from first principles um, might be preferred is that uh, it comes with this kind of uh, aspect of certainty, right? You can't be wrong about, you know, uh, geometry. You can't be wrong about your logic. The idea that you'd have to uh, defend empiricism because it's less certain is counterintuitive to us, but for people in the past uh, the situ who didn't really have uh, kind of the fruits of science and technology, um, the shoe was on the other foot, as it were. Uh, it was empiricism that needed defended against uh, deduction and logic and rationalism. Um, Right, at, at, at least from our modern point of view, right, we know that computers and cars and airplanes and satellites and GPS systems and so on don't run on magic. Right, either science is genuinely delivering new knowledge, or technology is completely unexplainable. Right, so the notion that science is giving us uh, reliable insight into the way things actually work. Uh, has to be correct because otherwise we can't explain uh, technology at all. Um, but back then, right? Th uh, again, um, it was empiricism that had to be defended from uh, the systems of certainty given to us by uh, rationalism. Um, and uh, ironically enough, uh, it is rationalism, right? Deduction from in the first premises, uh, which ends up being less certain because even though the method in principle guarantees freedom from error. Uh, in practice, the people that do it themselves are not free from error. Uh, so, uh, ironically enough, it is empiricism that yields us better information, uh, even though in theory it's supposed to be the other way around. Uh, anyway, here's Bacon. There are and can be only two ways of searching into and discovering truth. The w first one flies from the senses and particulars to the most general axioms, and from these principles the truth of which it takes for settled and immovable proceeds to judgment and the discovery of middle axioms, and this way is now in fashion. Okay, so that's rationalism, right? Well, what can I know for certain? What's absolutely true? And then I should deduce from that what Bacon calls middle, middle axioms, not, not foundational ones, but stuff about at the middle level uh, about reality. Um, and this is what's now in fashion, he says. He continues, quote, The other derives axioms from the senses and particulars, rising by a gradual and unbroken ascent, so that it arrives at the most general axioms last of all. This is the true way, but as yet untried. So he says, look, everybody's trying to find certain first principles to move from in foundational certainty, but that can't work. What we need to do is start from the particular, from the world of flux and uncertainty, and to collect these and to draw the appropriate generalizations and to move from particular to general and not general to particular. If a man will begin with certainty, he shall end in doubt. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. That's Bacon in The Advancement of Learning. Unfortunately, the scientific method has not been accepted um, in Bacon's time. And he said, look, the reasons people fall into error uh, can be categorized into like four different types, right? And these are the superstitions of the idols, the errors that have prevented progress from occurring. The idols of the tribe, right? People's tendency to perceive more order and regularity in systems than truly exists is due to people following their preconceived ideas about things, you know, what appears to be true, what my intuitions tell me, what I want there to be true. Um, Right, but in fact, uh, we need more careful observation because uh, we can't just trust what we think is right. We have to go out and check in, against reality. Uh, there's idols of the cave, right, which is people's personal weakness and reasoning due to their particular personalities, their likes, their dislikes, their biases, which we also have to control against. Right, that's why we need control groups and double-blind studies. The idols of the marketplace, right, confusions, use of language, taking some words in science to so a different meaning than their common usage. Um, for example, right, people say, like, well, evolution is just a theory, but uh, of course in everyday language we use theory to mean like a guess, uh, but in science we use theory to mean a uh, 
confirmed a fairly i mean to the extent confirmation occurs in science but a well confirmed hypothesis that has been tested is falsifiable um that has lots of evidence supporting it right so our everyday usage of theory and our technical usage of the word theory just kind of are different and there's the idols of the theater right the following of academic dogma not asking questions about the world taking things on authority so these four errors we have to be on our guard for in order for scientific progress to occur says bacon um, one l kind of a l lacuna, one shortcoming, if you will, of Bacon, as Russell points out, uh, is that he kind of neglects the importance of the hypothesis formation stage. He's, so Russell says, look, Bacon's inductive method is faulty through insufficient emphasis on hypothesis. He hoped that mere orderly arrangement of data would make the right hypothesis obvious, but this is seldom the case. Because as a rule, the framing of hypothesis is the most difficult part of scientific work, and the part where great ability is indispensable. That's Russell. And I think this is really exactly right. Elaborating a falsifiable hypothesis is usually prior to data collection. And this is because your hypothesis is the framework that will tell you what data to collect and allow you to interpret it, right? So the, uh, the more naive view of science sees hypothesis formation as the explanation of existing data, right? You look at your data and you say, well, what could explain this? Um, but usually what you should do is think of a hypothesis with some small amount of data, of course, because you're not working from nothing, um, and then ask yourself, okay, what would need to be the case for this hypothesis to be true or false? And then you collect the data that would falsify your hypothesis. All right, so you say, look, um, if this drug wouldn't, if this drug is no better than a placebo, it should make no difference whether there should be no difference in the results between the control group and the people actually receiving the medicine. So you should just do that experiment. Um, so you should start with the hypothesis and then try and generate the right kind of data to confirm or disconfirm it, right? To go back to our case about the Mpemba effect, right? Does hot water freeze faster than cold? You can't just start putting water in the fridge, right? Because there's too many variables. What you start, we need is a hypothesis, right? Is the hot water freezing faster because some of it's evaporating, right? Then you could, once you have that hypothesis, you could start isolating variables. So, you know, you can look at the volume uh, of ice in the hot water sample and the cold water sample to rule out or to confirm the role of evaporation. And if you look at the paper I linked to, you'll see lots of great examples of the hypothesis coming first, which will allow you to collect data because now you know what variables you actually should be looking at. Right? So, because you otherwise there's just too many, you just, you'll be overwhelmed by data. So, you need a hypothesis first approach. Um, Second small criticism, Bacon underestimates the importance of mathematical precision in developing good inductive arguments. All right, so in his zeal to defend empiricism and observation, he does neglect the role uh, mathematics and deduction does kind of play in being precise in our data collection and our hypothesis, right? Because any specific experiment will support the hypothesis in a cer certain kind of statistical way as a function of the sample size relative to the total population, uh, for example, in, a, in an opinion poll. Right, so if I'm taking an opinion poll, um, you know, you always get these kind of plus or minus certainty. That's a function of how big the sample is and how reliable I think the sample is as a representative of the total population. And that's all math. That's all statistics. But still, for his defense of empiricism and his elaboration of central aspects of inductive reasoning, Bacon is really a significant philosopher who truly laid the groundwork for the scientific revolution. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we'll see you guys on Tuesday.